Hello, welcome to Ms. Clark Reads to You. We are in the classroom in Tuesdays with Maury. I'm reading my Kindle edition. We are going to make a book brain or heart connection. What we're going to do for this particular video is I will read some and then I'm going to stop. And you'll stop the video. You will make a book brain or heart and connect book brain or heart connection. Then you can start the video again, and then I'll share mine with you. The classroom. The sun beamed in through the dining room window, lighting up the hardwood floor. We had been talking there for nearly two hours. The phone rang yet again, and Maury asked his helper Connie to get it. She had been jotting the caller's names in Maury's small black appointment book. Friends, meditation teachers, a discussion group, someone who wanted to photograph him for a magazine. It was clear I was not the only one interested in visiting my old professor. The nightline appearance had made him something of a celebrity. But I was impressed with perhaps even a bit envious of all the friends that Maury seemed to have. I thought about the buddies that circled my orbit back in college. Where had they gone? You know, Mitch, now that I'm dying, I've become much more interesting to people. You were always interesting. <laughs> Maury smiled, you're kind. No, I'm not, I thought. Here's the thing. You see, people see me as a bridge. I'm not as alive as I used to be, but I'm not dead yet. I'm sort of in between. He coughed. <coughs> and then he regained his smile. I, I'm on the last great journey here, and people want me to tell them what to pack. The phone rang again. Maury, can you talk? I'm visiting with my old pal now, he announced. Let them call back. I cannot tell you why he received me so warmly. I was hardly the promising student who had left him 16 years earlier. Had it not been for Nightline, Maury might have died without ever seeing me again. I had no good excuse for this, except the one that everyone these days seems to have. I had become too wrapped up in the siren song of my own life. I was busy. What happened to me? I asked myself. Maury's high, smoky voice took me back to my university years when I thought rich people were evil, a shirt and tie were prison clothes, and life without freedom to get up and go, a motorcycle beneath you, breeze in your face, down the streets of Paris into the mountains of Tibet, was not a good life at all. What happened to me? The 80s happened. The 90s happened. Death and sickness and getting fat and going bald happened. And I traded lots of dreams for bigger paychecks. And I never even realized I was doing it. Yet here was Maury talking with the wonder of our college years as, a, as if I'd simply been on a long vacation. Have you found someone to share your heart with, he asked. Are you given to your community? Are you at peace with yourself? Are you trying to be as human as you can be? I squirmed, wanting to show I had been grappling deeply with such questions. What happened to me? I once promised myself I would never work for money and that I would join the Peace Corps and that I would live in beautiful, inspirational places. Instead, I had been in Detroit for 10 years now at the same workplace using the same bank, visiting the same barber. I was 37, more efficient than in college, tied to computers and modems and cell phones. I wrote articles about rich athletes who, for the most part, could not care less about people like me. I was no longer young for my peer group, nor did I walk around in gray sweatshirts with unlit cigarettes in my mouth. I did not have long discussions over egg salad sandwiches about the meaning of life. My days were full, yet I remained, much of the time, unsatisfied. What happened to 
to me. Coach, I said suddenly, remembering the nickname. Maury beamed. Oh, that's me. I'm still your coach. He laughed and resumed his eating, a meal he had started 40 minutes earlier. And I watched him now, his hands working gingerly, as if he were learning to use them for the very first time. He could not press down hard with a knife. His fingers shook. Each bite was a struggle. He chewed the food finely before swallowing, and sometimes it slid out the sides of his lips so that he had to put down what he was holding and dab his face with a napkin. The skin from his wrist to his knuckles was dotted with age spots, and it was loose like skin hanging from a chicken soup bone. For a while, we just ate like that. A sick old man, a healthy younger man, both absorbing the quiet of the room. I would say it was an embarrassed silence, but I seemed to be the only one embarrassed. So stop the video here and make a book, a brain, or a heart connection, and then turn the video back on and I'll share with you mine. So I'm going to um, say what surprised me was the depth of their friendship. When Mitch was in college, that Mitch could actually go 16 years without talking to this warm, friendly, caring human being that he had seemed to have such a strong bond with. And Maury is acting like there's no distance, like they were never apart. And Mitch is the one struggling. Dying, Maury suddenly said. There's only one thing to be sad over, Mitch. Living unhappily is something else. So many of the people who come to visit me are unhappy. Why? Well, for one thing, the culture we have does not make people feel good about themselves. You see, we're teaching the wrong things. And you have to be strong enough to say, if the culture doesn't work, well, don't buy it. Create your own culture. Most people can't do it. <laughs> They're more unhappy than me, even in my current situation. I may be dying, but I am surrounded by loving, caring souls. How many people can say that? I was astonished by his lack, his complete lack of self-pity. Maury, who could no longer dance, swim, bathe, or walk. Maury, who could no longer answer his own door, dry himself after a shower, or even roll over in bed. How could he be so accepting? I watched him struggle with his fork, picking at a piece of tomato, missing it the first two times. Oh, a pathetic scene, and yet I could not deny that sitting in his presence was almost magically serene. The same calm breeze that soothed me back in college. I shot a glance at my watch, force of habit, it was getting late and I thought about changing my plane reservation home and then Maury did something that haunts me to this day. You know how I'm gonna die, he said, and I raised my eyebrows. I'm going to suffocate. Yes, my lungs, because of my asthma, can't handle the disease. It's moving up my body, this ALS. It's already got my legs. Pretty soon it'll get my arms and hands. And when it hits my lungs, he shrugged his shoulders. I'm sunk. I, I had no idea what to say, so I said, oh, well, you know, I mean, you never know. Maury closed his eyes. I know, Mitch, I know. You mustn't be afraid of my dying. I've had a good life. 
we all know it's going to happen. I may be out four or five months. Come on, I said nervously. Nobody can say, oh, I can, he said softly. There's even a little test a doctor showed me. A test? Inhale a few times. I did as he said. Now, once more. But this time, when you exhale, count as many numbers as you can before you take another breath. I quickly exhaled the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, eight. And I reached 70 before my breath was gone. Good, Maury said. You have healthy lungs. Now watch what I do. He inhaled. Then began his number count in a soft, wobbly voice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, <laughs> eighteen. And he stopped gasping for air. When the doctor first asked me to do this, I could reach twenty-three. Now it's eighteen. He closed his eyes and shook his head. My tank is almost empty. I tapped my thighs nervously. Whew, that was enough for one afternoon. Come back and see your old professor, Maury said when I hugged him goodbye. I promised I would. And I tried not to think about the last time I promised this. So sometimes when I teach this in the classroom, I challenge my students to stop there and do the breath test and one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one twenty two twenty three twenty four twenty five twenty six twenty seven twenty eight twenty nine thirty thirty one thirty two thirty three thirty four thirty five thirty six thirty seven thirty eight thirty nine forty forty one forty two forty three whoo so clearly i need some more cardiovascular work but you saw how far I could get. And so do that little test. Breathe in and do that little test to see how athletically strong your lungs are. In the campus bookstore, I shop for the items on Maury's reading list. I purchased books I never knew existed. Titles such as Youth, Identity, and Crisis. I am now the divided self. We're in the italics, flashback. Before college, I did not know the study of human relations could be considered scholarly until I met Maury. I did not believe it. But his passion for books is real and contagious. We begin to talk seriously sometimes after class when the room is emptied. He asks me questions about my life and then quotes lines from Eric Fromm, Martin Buber, Eric Erickson. Often he defers to their words, footnoting his own advice, even though he obviously thought the same thing himself. It is at these times that I realize he is indeed a professor, not an uncle. <laughs> and one afternoon I'm complaining about the confusion of my age, what is expected of me versus what I want for myself. Have I told you about the tension of opposites, he says? The tension of opposites? Yeah, life is a series of holes back and forth and you want to do one thing, but you're bound to do something else. Something hurts you, yet you know you shouldn't, and you take certain things for granted even when you know you should never take anything for granted. It's a tension of opposites. A tension of opposites. Like a pull on a rubber band. And most of us live somewhere in the middle. It sounds like a wrestling match, I say. Ha! A wrestling match. Yes, you could describe life that way. So, which side wins, I ask. Which side wins? He smiles at me. The crinkled eyes, the crooked teeth. Love wins. Love always wins. And we'll stop there for today. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to reading to you again. Have a beautiful day, and I'm thinking of you.